The title this morning is To Be Consumed. To Be Consumed. Imagine with me just for a moment, for those of you, if you want to close your eyes, you can, or if you just want to keep them open. But maybe, you know, many of you have seen the scene in a movie where the actor or actresses, maybe even a family, are flying over a jungle canopy area and the plane goes down. Right? And in the process, they either parachute out at the last minute or they find themselves climbing out of the wreckage to look around and see only trees, bushes, and green as far as the eye can see. Though they have survived the crash, now they are lost in the jungle. And at this moment, they have to decipher first where they are, and second, what next steps they're going to take to get out of the dangerous jungle. In essence, they have been consumed by the jungle surrounding them. To be consumed. I had Joel put this image up. You see yourself there in the jungle. Whatever circumstances led you to there, I just gave the plane crash as an example. But whatever it is, you find yourself consumed in the jungle, right? And you can't distinguish, per se, where your next step is, what you need to do. I mean, it, 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 there's nothing to distinguish, okay, there's a path here or there's a path there. What, looks, what it looks like here, it looks like over there. And if I was to turn around, about face, it's the same thing all around. The only, di the only distinguishing factor, I guess, in this particular image is you have the sunbeams coming down. So you can somewhat pierce through the top and, and be able to tell what's up versus what's down, right? But that's about the gist of it. You're, you're basically consumed in the jungle. Today, we are going to talk about what consumes us. In a nutshell, y'all have heard me ask the question time and time again. When it comes to life, are you living life or are you letting life live you? In other words, are the circumstances surrounding you dictating your next steps and you are simply on autopilot going from one moment to the next as life determines it? Or are you intentionally calculating your decisions to line up with God's best and pursuing living life with determination and confident release of your life into his hands? This is very basic, but it really applies on a daily basis. When we wake up, we get the opportunity. Am I going to be consumed by my circumstances? Or am I going to be consumed by a loving God? And it starts there. It starts there. I want somebody, if you're willing to, to read a scripture or two, if, if you just raise your hand, and, and I'll pass you this mic here. Uh, Lena, and then one other person. Where is that other mic? Actually, it's right there, uh, Joel. Thank you. One other person. Autumn, and you can you can stay back there. That's fine. Um, I'm going to pass you the mic here. Lena, or oh, there you go. This is Luke 17. Luke comes before John. <laughs> Luke 17, 33. Right, right there, whoever. Okay, so just 33? Yeah, just 33, and then I'll give a little context. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. All right, thank you. So a little context, and then if you want to walk that back to Autumn, Joel, thank you. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. Jesus is talking. This is him addressing the disciples, and he's talking about the kingdom of God. 
And he's basically giving explanation that back in Noah's day and then even, uh, I think it's in Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, and Lot, the days of Lot, whenever there's eating and drinking and people are going about their business and so forth and so on, it talks about whenever the Son of Man comes, that we need to be ready to count the cost. And whoever chooses, just like Lot's wife, to look back at their life and to go back to retrieve will lose their life. So many people are caught up in all the circumstances and their commitments of this life that they have lost their first love and they are not consumed by the only relationship that ultimately matters, and that is the relationship between you and God. So again, it says, in verse 32, it says, Remember Lot's wife, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. Are you living your life, or is your life living you? Okay? All right, Autumn, you ready? Uh, I'm sorry, I I didn't give it to you. Matthew uh, chapter 10, 39. Matthew 10, 39. Give you a second to turn there. I should have given it to you sooner. You let me know when you're ready. Go for it. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna reemphasize it. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake. We'll find it again. Jesus is talking and he's talking about counting the cost. Counting the cost. Uh, As I was thinking about this. I think we've fallen short in the church. In a major way. By presenting the gospel as a simple say a prayer and then continue to live life like you already did. That's not the gospel message. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you can continue to live the life you already lived before you acknowledged him as Lord with a hope and with a a gift of like, I get to go to heaven now, but I can continue to live whatever way I want to. That's not the message. There's a cost There is sacrifice. There is obedience that God calls us to. And again, it's not works that lead us to salvation. It is only by grace that we have been saved. But there is to be transformation. There is to be newness of life. And there is to be an allowance of conviction of the Holy Spirit to say, you know what? You can't keep doing these same things. This is not God's best for you. And are you going to be consumed by your own choices? Or are you going to be consumed by the one who knows best and the one that cares most for you? Back to being consumed. How many of you have heard of God referred to as an all-consuming fire? Right? That's really where this, this message was stemmed from. It was just echoed in my heart. And it was God just dealing with me and even talking to me about him wanting to be an all-consuming fire even in my life. And I thought, man, God, what are you wanting to consume? I'm already giving, I already know, I don't know what more to give until, guess what, you give him access. He says, well, what about this over here? What about that over there? What about that response? What about that thought? What about that action? All of a sudden, when you start giving him access into areas, you start realizing, okay, maybe I haven't let him consume everything. He needs to be the all-consuming fire. All-consuming When one thinks of fire, many times we immediately think of destruction and fear grips us. Maybe we think of a forest fire or a home on fire and the need to to put it out, right? That's, That's a lot of times where our mind goes. The word consuming can have different meanings. It can mean to use up when you consume something to the to the point that it's not there anymore. 
to destroy or to annihilate or to absorb the attention of someone or something. In Scripture, fire can be used as a form of judgment, but it is also used in purification and refining. Right? We see in Scripture time and time again where, yes, there was hellfire and brimstone. There was raining down of God's judgment in the Old Testament time and time again uh, against those people that were countering him, that were not abiding, that were not obeying his decrees. They were going before and making a way, right, for the children of God. And then there's also representation of a uh, refiner's fire. The purity of what God wants to do, the burning up of the dross, the, the burning away of the chaff, the stuff that's there, the, the things that taint, the impurities that enter into our hearts and into our lives. Why? Because we're born into this world that has fallen. It's not that we seek out to have impurities. It's that we were born into a fallen world. And praise God, he is a God of redemption. He has made a way to purify us. We no longer have to remain impure, dirty, unworthy. He has made a way. This term consuming fire, if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to read a little bit. I want to share this with you guys. I'm going to try to make this quick because I do want us to partake in communion, and I think it's very important to kind of build the foundation here of what I'm saying because we're going to have a time of reflection and even in, uh, examining our own hearts before we partake in communion. But Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 18, the Hebrew writer is comparing two different mountains. I'm going to read this to you. It's a mountain of fear and a mountain of joy. Verse 18, it says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was, being, what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Okay, the Hebrew writer is referring to the Mount of Horeb or Mount Sinai whenever Moses went up to get the commands. And whenever the children of Israel going up and God was speaking from the mountain and it was so powerful. They were in such awe and amazement, but not like, ha, ha, giddy, giddy, happy, happy, joy, joy. No, it was like, oh, my gosh, fire and power and fear. It said that Moses was trembling because of how powerful God was. And the holiness, the purity that God has and had at that time said that even if an animal, animal was to touch the mountain, that it had to be, because it wasn't worthy. I mean, it's, it's just hard for us to, now New Testament and understanding Jesus and how he paid the price so that we can even enter in to, to wrap our mind around it, yet that is how holy and righteous God is. Even today, he has not changed his righteousness. He has not changed his holiness. He has not changed his worthiness. So what's changed? Our perspective, maybe? Our taking advantage of God's grace? Maybe even watering it down? Not fully applying it the way that we should? 22, Hebrew writer says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of, the new, of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Listen to this. 
If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, that's what God was doing on that big mountain when they were trembling and freaking out. How much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Oh, God, your grace is so amazing. We got to hear this. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. People get ready. There's a shaking coming. If we're asleep, if we're just conditioned to be like, ha, 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 everything's good and go, get ready. 27, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken that is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably. This is key. Acceptably worshiping God. Worship that he accepts. With reverence. In awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Worship that's acceptable to him. Not just because it feels good, not just because it sounds good, not just because it's what's expected of our culture, but a worship that is acceptable and pleasing to God, that is reverencing him in giving awe and honor to him. You want to hear the encouraging part? God is a consuming fire. Nothing gets in God's way. Nothing gets in God's way. Going back to what I started out earlier, and I was talking about battling, battling with someone versus for some for God. Remember, God and, and the enemy are not on the same plane. They're not on the same level. It's not the way it's depicted with little cartoons and you have God on one shoulder. and the, No, it's not even close. It's not even a comparison. God is so much bigger. He is so much greater than anything that the devil might try to throw at you or to do. His darts can be extinguished like that with the power of God. But do we trust him? Do we reverence him? Do we fear him? Do we trust him? I pray we do. We have to. We have to. <sighs> Remember, he is worthy of honor and reverence. We as his people are to fear the Lord. I know in this New Testament mindset and with all the grace that God has given us, we aren't supposed to fear God. Yes, we are. We are to fear God. We are to give him reverence. He is still holy. He is still just. And our sin still has consequences. Our disobedience still has consequences. Yes, has Jesus forgiven us? Has, has he paid the price on the cross? Yes, he has. And we're thankful for it. But that doesn't excuse away our responsibility to still obey what God is directing us to do. As Paul writes, just because grace abounds, does that mean we get to sin all the more? By all means, no. We don't want to continue on in that way. Never forgetting his power and our need to obey his commands. This is all based. The Hebrew writer actually was referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. If you want to turn there real quick, just as a point of reference. Deuteronomy 24, and I encourage you to go back and read this. This is, again, chapter 4. Obedience is commanded, and God is talking to Israel, giving them decrees. And he's talking about idolatry being for forbidden. And it gets down to 21, and, and it says, The Lord was angry with me, talking 
Moses is saying this because of you. And he solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter the good land. The Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance. I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan, but you are about to cross over and take possession of that good land. 23 is the warning. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Consuming fire again. He is a jealous God. A jealous God. What does that mean and why should I be thankful for that? What does that mean that God is a jealous God and why should I as his creation be thankful for that? I'm going to tell you. He cherishes you to the point of protection and values you so much that he doesn't want to share you with the worldly advances upon your heart. The world wants to take your heart. The enemy is coming after you. He will come in in whatever way we allow to give a crap. Don't give an inch because he will take it. Right? God doesn't want that for you. He does not want to share you with the enemy. He has paid, he being God, has paid the ultimate price of his only son as a redemption component to your heart, keeping in mind that you did not earn his affection towards you. Love is simply who he is. And you were his choice. Some of y'all need to hear that this morning. God loves you. You are his choice. Catch this. You are his. You can either accept him in his gift of redeeming love. And I know this sounds harsh. Brace yourself. Or you can spit on him by seeking out the affection of others. You might go, Pastor, that's harsh. I want you to think it like that. When you choose the affection of others instead of God's affection, you're spitting on God. You said, that's grotesque. That's, that's. They did it to Jesus. And you go, well, I would never. Would you? Never? All-consuming to be consumed by him. I've heard it said, either he is your everything or he is nothing. There's not this in between, I'm partially his and partially not. All consumed or just some of me consumed. Doesn't work that way. Why? Why? Jesus didn't die on the cross for just a piece of you. He died for all of you, body, soul, and spirit. So when the devil tries to come and tempt you and give you this and that and the other, put it back in his face and say, no, I have been redeemed. I've been bought with a price. God is bigger. Satan, you have to get behind me. I'm not giving you place. I'm done with that. The song, How He Loves, whenever I think of he is jealous for me, that, that song, How He Loves, comes to me, and it says, he is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and his mercy. I was going to read the rest of the lyrics, but that's the gist of it, y'all. He is jealous for you. He wants you. He does not want the enemy to have any peace of you. So don't give the enemy any peace. Let him, let God be all-consuming. 
Of course, the goal each one of us should have as believers and followers of Jesus is to be consumed by him, to embrace and be engulfed by his love. But I want to get real for a second. What is consuming you in your current season of life? What do you go to bed thinking about? What do you wake up in the morning thinking about? Throughout the day, what is driving you? What is influencing your decisions? Is it politics? Is it news? Is it lust? Is it greed? Is it anger? I know these are harsh words and you're like, Ryan, what's going on? This is a heavy word, but it's so needed at times. We need to hear the truth and we need to understand that our world is already consumed with all of these things. And we are to be a light in the darkness. And unless we are not consumed by these things, we are walking the course just right alongside of all of the rest of them. So we have to deal with it. We have to address it. We have to call upon the Lord to say, you know what? I don't want to be consumed. I don't want any part of me consumed by the enemy. I don't want him to have access. Only the Lord. What's something else that can disappoint or that can consume us? What about disappointments? Disappointment can drive and devour your decisions, or you can entrust those disappointments into the Lord's hands and allow him to use it to inspire and direct you into better decisions ahead. The enemy loves to heap on shame and guilt for poor decisions made either by yourself or others, whereas God brings proper and just conviction to deal with and help you, all the while encouraging you every step of the way as you navigate through those disappointments and difficult times. Why is that? Because God loves you. The devil doesn't love you. He's not going to help you. He's only going to take you down in the pit as far as it can go. Don't let disappointments, and you will be disappointed. You will have trials and tribulations. Like Jesus says, we are in a fallen world. It's going to happen. But what we do with those is what makes the difference. Are we going to let the disappointments dictate and devour, or are we going to say, you know what, God? This didn't catch you off guard. I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to seek your face, and I'm going to allow you to teach me whatever lessons I need to learn, even if I was the one that made the mistake. I'll own up to it, and I will seek your face, and you will help carry me through. Again, temporal versus eternal. What's more important? What has more value in the long run? Being in right relationship with man, which is good, or being in right relationship with God. What profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul, right? It's not a profit to gain the whole world if we lose our soul. It's ultimately, where, where do we stand with God? What's consuming us? I already kind of alluded to this. I'm going to deal with this, the sin issue. Maybe you're going through a season struggling with sin. You know better, you've already felt the conviction, but you are still dealing with the temptation and caving to it. You need God's consuming fire to come and to devour and annihilate that wrong fleshly desire. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Seek him. Don't give the devil room. Don't open the door. By all means, don't open the door. But when you find yourself in situations, struggles, temptations, or otherwise, go to the Lord. Ask for forgiveness. Get help. Addictions are across the span of all kinds of different things where the enemy is trying to counter the good works that God has for us to do. And he does it by distraction and by addiction. So here we go. Nicole, you want to come on up? It is a good practice. Everybody say good practice. To ask for the purifying fire of the Lord 
to come in and to purge our hearts and our minds of anything that is not of him. So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to partake in communion. I'm going to read from that. But I am charging you with the responsibility. You can't answer for your spouse. You can't answer for your kids. You can only answer for yourself. Let this be personal right now between you and God. And say, Holy Spirit, search my heart. If there's anything in me that is unclean, that is not of you, Jesus, you paid the price on the cross. We're about to celebrate that in communion. I want to acknowledge my wrongs. I want to ask for forgiveness of my sins. I repent of the wrongs that I have done. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Purify me. Even as it says, take the coal. Cleanse my lips. Burn away anything that is not holy, that is not right. I lean solely upon you and your righteousness. On your blood, your redemptive work. This isn't me trying to conjure it up. It is simply me being humbled and willing to acknowledge that I have fallen short and that I am a man in need of a savior. So I'm going to let you do that as Nicole sings this and plays this. Let's just have a quiet time of examining our own hearts before we partake as the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper.
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. <sighs> Accepting the Lord's discipline. Discipline is not an easy thing to accept in the flesh. We don't like it. But our spirits long for the Lord to guide us and direct us. Feed your spirit, man. To commune with God is to say, I want my spirit to be in communion with you, God. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? Remember this. Jesus paid the price in full on the cross, giving himself completely flesh and blood so that we could have access unto the Father. So as we partake of this communion this morning, this bread symbolizing his body, I know it sounds really graphic, but think about Jesus and his body on that cross. And if you're all consumed by him, are you lining your heart up with his? I pray that you've already asked for forgiveness and that you will set your heart on him, align yourself up and say, God, I never want to spit on you. I don't want one ounce of your blood shed to go to waste. Jesus, you gave completely of yourself for me. And I accept you. And I love you. If you can say that this morning, go ahead and partake of the bread. Hold that cup. The fruit of the vine representing his blood. I saw earlier this week there was a clip of a pastor preaching and he was talking about the Eucharist and he was talking about the value of communion and the Lord's Supper and how Jesus was very point blank with not just his 12 disciples but with all the disciples, all of those following him. And remember in the scripture says that many of them turned away. They could not accept what Jesus was saying. They could not embrace partaking in the body and in the blood of the lamb. And Jesus looked at his other disciples and said, are you going to go too? He put it right there with them. It's your choice. Think about that, the weight of that. The gospel message, the great commission hung in the balance in the decision of some of those men making the choice and saying, no, we're with you. We're going to partake. We want you to consume us completely. Where else would we go? Is that how you approach your life with the Lord? When he calls out and asks you to do things for his work and his purposes, do you say, well, maybe, but I got to do this first. I got to go say bye to someone. 
or do you say all or nothing? Where else will I go? Who else would I turn to? Counting the cost. If you can say that this morning, let's partake. I'm going to conclude this way and just simply say this. In the days ahead, I want to encourage you to release your disappointments into his hands, to allow the Holy Spirit to burn away the chaff, to accept the purification process of God as an all-consuming fire. Remind the devil that you have been bought with a price. And that God is a jealous God who loves you so incredibly much. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for loving us. Lord, we have at times fallen short. Thank you that once again we can come before your throne. And Lord, that you are faithful to forgive us of our sins. When we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I don't know where everybody stands in their walk with you. We, we, we only see really just what's on the surface. And yes, there's fruit. There's things that are obvious. But Lord, you are able to look into the deeper things. The thoughts that we have the actions that we take when no one's looking, the struggles that we face, the the anxiety, the worries that capture us. And yes, so many times we know what we are supposed to do. And yet we're weak. We struggle. Let us not take a defeated mindset, but that, Lord, we would find victory in you today and in the days ahead that we would be all consumed by you mighty God as an all consuming fire we love you and we thank you in Jesus mighty name amen